This is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Ashley Thompson and John Russell, Brian Lynn and Anna Mateo. Ashley and John tell us that Israel has put robotic weapons in place in the West Bank. The systems can fire tear gas, stun grenades, and sponge-tipped bullets. Israel says the system is safe, but critics say there are problems with unmanned weapons. Brian comes next on the program. His story discusses what the United Nations sees as a very worrisome health crisis in Haiti. Already 175 people have died from a cholera outbreak. The UN is looking for almost $150 million to fight the sickness. Later on today's show, I will bring you the Higher Education Report. If you are a student or professor using Twitter, you might want to listen. Two experts discuss how Elon Musk's takeover of the social media service will change academic Twitter. And then, if you like listening to Ana Mateo's words and their stories, you will want to listen to this week's program about confined spaces. Be sure to stay with us after the program, as we will learn about Anna's favorite place to walk in Washington, D.C. And now, here are Ashley and John. In two areas in the occupied West Bank, Israel has put in robotic weapons that can fire tear gas, stun grenades, and sponge-tipped bullets at Palestinian protesters. The weapons, located in the El Arub refugee camp and the city of Hebron, use artificial intelligence to follow targets. Israel says the technology saves lives, both Israeli and Palestinian, but critics see moral or ethical problems with such weapons systems. The robotic weapons systems come at a time of increased tensions in the occupied West Bank. Unrest has risen there during what has been the deadliest year since 2006. The victory by former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's alliance which includes a party with close ties to the settler movement, has raised concerns of more violence. One of the weapon systems is located on a guard tower overlooking the El Arub refugee camp in the southern West Bank. Witnesses say that when young Palestinian protesters enter the streets throwing stones and firebombs at Israeli soldiers, the weapons shoot tear gas or sponge-tipped bullets at them. About a month ago, the military also placed the robots in the nearby city of Hebron, where soldiers often clash with stone-throwing Palestinians. The army declined to comment on its plans to deploy the system elsewhere in the West Bank. Palestinian activist Isa Amro said Hebron residents fear the new weapon might be misused or hacked. He added that people also do not like what they say is a weapons test on civilians. We are not a training and simulation for Israeli companies, he said. This is something new that must be stopped. There are no soldiers next to the machines. Instead, the weapons are operated by remote control. 
At the touch of a button, soldiers inside a guard tower can fire at selected targets. The army says the system is under testing and fires only non-lethal weapons used for crowd control, such as sponge-tipped bullets and tear gas. Robotic weapons are increasingly common around the world. Militaries use drones to carry out lethal strikes in places like Ukraine and Ethiopia. Remote-controlled guns like the Israeli system in the West Bank have been used by the United States in Iraq, by South Korea along the border with North Korea, and by Syrian rebel groups. Israel, known for its advanced military technologies, is among the world's top producers of drones capable of launching precision-guided missiles. It has built a fence along its border with the Gaza Strip, equipped with radar and underground and underwater sensors. Above ground, it uses a robotic vehicle, equipped with cameras and machine guns, to patrol borders. Israel is using technology as a means to control the civil population, said Dror Sado. Spokeswoman for Israeli rights group B'Tselem. She said that even supposedly non lethal weapons like sponge bullets can cause extreme pain and even be deadly. The system in El Arub was built by Smart Shooter, a company that makes fire control systems that it says increase the accuracy, lethality, and situational awareness of small arms. The company has deals with many militaries around the world, including the U.S. Army. Speaking at the company's headquarters in Kibbutz Yagur in northern Israel, Chief Executive Michal Moore said the gun requires human selection of targets and military equipment. They always have a man making the decision regarding the legitimate target, she said. She said the system reduces injuries and deaths by distancing soldiers from violence and by making shots more accurate. But Omar Shakir the Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch, said Israel is on a slide toward the digital dehumanization of weapons systems. By using such technologies, Shakir said Israel is creating a powder keg for human rights abuse. A powder keg is a situation that is likely to become dangerous or violent. In El Arub, Residents say the machines fire without warning. It is very fast, even faster than the soldiers, said Kamal Abu Hishesh, a 19-year-old student. He described almost nightly clashes where soldiers enter the camp as the automated gun fires tear gas. Paul Shari of the Center for a New American Security is a former U.S. Army shooting expert. He said that without emotion and with a better aim, automated systems can possibly reduce violence. But he said the absence of international rules for killer robots is a problem. Otherwise, he said, it is only a matter of time before these weapon systems are equipped to use deadly force. I'm John Russell. And I'm Ashley Thompson. The United Nations and Haiti are seeking $146 million to help fight a cholera outbreak that has already killed at least 175 people. Health officials in Haiti say cholera cases have quickly been rising since life started returning to normal 
after a fuel blockade halted many forms of business and services. The blockade forced gas stations to close, hospitals to reduce services, and banks and stores to limit hours. The blockade was established in mid-September by a powerful Haitian gang. The gang recently lifted the blockade, and gas stations reopened last weekend across Haiti. Dr. Janti Fils is a spokesman for Haiti's Ministry of Health. He told the Associated Press that people are back on the streets and likely spreading cholera as the government struggles to contain the problem. We need more resources, Phils said. Cholera cases continue to climb in Haiti. The Pan-American Health Organization, PAHO, estimates at least 175 people have died from the latest cholera outbreak and more than 7,600 have been hospitalized. The actual number of cases is likely much higher because of underreporting of the disease. The worsening situation in Haiti led the government, the UN, and other partners to appeal for $146 million to help fight cholera. Health officials fear that at least half a million people in Haiti are at risk of becoming infected. Ulrika Richardson is a special UN representative in Haiti. She called the rising case count and fast spread of the disease across the country worrying. Phils noted that cholera cases were likely contained during the fuel blockade since gas stations were closed and many in the country of more than 11 million people remained home. Stephanie Mayron is a medical operations official for Doctors Without Borders. She said if people sickened with cholera start traveling to areas with poor sanitation and a lack of drinking water, the number of cases will likely keep rising. It's a match that can light a fire, Mayron added. The number of patients seeking help at Doctors Without Borders hospitals in the capital of Port-au-Prince greatly increased in recent weeks. So far, more than 6,500 patients have been admitted. Beds filled up so quickly that the aid group was forced to open a fifth center two weeks ago, said Doctors Without Borders official Alexandra Marcou. The PAHO told the AP it is supporting Haiti's government in preparing a request for cholera vaccines and planning to launch vaccination campaigns. But health experts say it remains unclear when those efforts will begin. In October, the World Health Organization, WHO, announced a worldwide cholera vaccine shortage that forced it to suspend its usual two-dose administration policy. Mehran of Doctors Without Borders noted that a single dose can lower one's risk by only 40%. The World Health Body said the shortage happened at a time of unprecedented rise in cholera outbreaks worldwide. At least 29 countries have reported cholera cases this year, compared with fewer than 20 on average for the past five years, the WHO said. I'm Brian Lynn.
Businessman Elon Musk became the owner of Twitter just three weeks ago, and many people have been concerned about the future of the social media company ever since. Alexandra Roberts is a law and media professor at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. She had this to say. I have been a really active Twitter user for a long time, and I have made fantastic connections there that have helped with my scholarship and with my teaching. And also I've been able to learn from a lot of other people, and I've been able to build a network. And I've gotten a lot of opportunities there as well. Since Musk took over, Roberts said, everything kind of went haywire. Haywire means something that is out of control or not working. She noted that Twitter may no longer be as safe a space as in the past. There is less certainty that people are who they say they are. Shortly after his takeover of Twitter, Musk started a service that permitted anyone willing to pay $8 a month to get a verified account. In the past, a verified account was only available to the government, companies, reporters, and well-known figures verified by Twitter. Someone then set up a verified account with the name of the drug company, Eli Lilly. The account set out a tweet saying its insulin drug, which helps people with diabetes, would be free. The false tweet forced the real company to post an apology. Others set up false accounts under the names of well-known politicians and athletes and even Musk's own companies of Tesla and SpaceX. The service, called Twitter Blue, has since been suspended. Musk also cut half of Twitter's workforce, and changes in the service made some important employees decide to leave. The developments concern people who have used the service for 16 years. Already, people are leaving Twitter, and companies are pulling back advertisements. A 2018 study published in PLOS One says Twitter has played an important role in the discovery of scholarly information and cross-disciplinary knowledge spreading. The study also says people use the service to share real-time information and make connections. Roberts agreed that Twitter has been a good service for professors and students to connect with those who have similar work or school interests. During the COVID-19 pandemic, instead of going to large business events, people stayed home and were able to use Twitter to stay connected. But Roberts added that the service just became a lot less safe, and this might be a time when people want to be more careful about what they share. Roberts said, It is probably a good idea for people to back up all the information they have on Twitter. She suggested students add other services, such as email or LinkedIn, to stay in touch with their contacts. You don't need to necessarily move things completely offline, but you once you make a connection, it's smart to have um, some other way to, to continue that conversation with that person. Roy Gutterman teaches media law at Syracuse University in New York State. He advised students to be cautious and make sure that information was from trusted sources. On Twitter, Gutterman said, it is a good idea to look at who is following an account to determine whether it is real. He said technology has made it easier for people to share and connect but that they should be prepared for changes. Cyberspace is littered with all sorts of dead entities, social media, email, and other forms of media. So, um, you know, maybe the next major social media outlet is in gestation right now and will be born, or maybe people go back to Facebook. 
And Roberts added that students who use Twitter to look for jobs or opportunities should get what you need, but know it could be gone tomorrow. I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give you examples and notes on usage. Today, we go inside a building and talk about a feature of every building: walls. Walls protect us from the outside world. They can help us stay safe and give us comfort. But what if we are inside a room too long? Those same walls can start to feel like a prison. We can feel trapped by them. When that happens, we can say the walls are closing in on us. This means you are feeling confined or stuck in an area. For example, after a year of living with the COVID nineteen pandemic, I felt like the walls of my house were closing in on me. When that feeling came over me, I knew I needed to go outside for a walk. When you feel trapped or confined indoors. A walk outside usually helps. Not only are you in the fresh air, but you are also looking at different things. A change of scenery can help when you feel like the walls are closing in. Sometimes the walls in this idiom are not actual walls in a building. Instead, they are walls in our minds. Or in a certain situation, we can use the expression "the walls are closing in" when we are sick and tired of something. For example, if you are unable to make advances in your job, you could feel like the walls have closed in on your career. You may feel like you don't have the chance to advance or try new things. It can feel like the walls are closing in on a relationship too. When people find themselves in very restricted relationships with someone who is trying to control them, it may feel like the walls are closing in on them. In these cases, a change of scenery is not found outside in the woods. The change of scenery is a new job. Or a new relationship. When the walls feel like they are closing in, we can also use another word to describe what we are feeling: claustrophobic. Claustrophobia is defined as an abnormal fear of being in closed or confined spaces. Sometimes we use the term claustrophobic. To mean we feel uneasy by a situation that is limiting or restricting. This feeling of unease could be from physical or non-physical reasons. A job and a relationship can also feel claustrophobic. Now let's listen to two people use the words and expressions you heard in this story. Hey, what happened to Chad? I haven't seen him around D.C. lately. During the pandemic, he moved out west, somewhere in the desert. The desert? What made him do that? He said he felt too claustrophobic in the city and was sick and tired of being around so many people. He needed more space and open skies. I can understand that. Sometimes the walls of my apartment feel like they are closing in on me, but moving to the desert is a pretty extreme decision. He'll be back. He texted me last night, complaining that it takes him thirty minutes 
to drive to the nearest store. Well, he wanted more space. Now he's got it. Yep. And that brings us to the end of this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Anna. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English broadcast. We hope you all enjoyed that report about confined spaces. We are joined now on the program by the presenter of Words and Their Stories, Anna Mateo. Welcome, Anna. Thanks, Dan. I am so glad to be here. Thanks for arranging this conversation. So, Anna. I remember working from my very small apartment during the first part of the COVID nineteen pandemic, when the walls were closing in. I went for a walk on the National Mall in Washington D.C. Where did you go when the walls were closing in? What a great question! When I felt the walls closing in on me, I would also take a walk. My favorite walk was to a monastery. A monastery is a place of worship, but this one is open to the public, and it has flower gardens and fish ponds, so it is very peaceful and beautiful. That must have been a good place to get some fresh air. Anna, you also mention. That sometimes people feel like the walls are closing in, when they have a job that they are not happy with. What are some of the jobs you had before coming to work at VOA? Well, I have worked in many different industries and have had many different jobs, but I never felt trapped, like the walls were closing in on me. See, I come from a working-class family in West Virginia. People in my family worked in a steel mill, and friends of mine had family who worked in the coal mines. Those are tough and dangerous jobs, especially a coal mine. Those walls are literally closing in around you. But right now, I love teaching English, and I learn something new every day. So I don't feel like any walls are closing in on me. Thanks, Anna. I'm glad you could tell our listeners about this American English expression. You are welcome, Dan. Bye. That's Anna Mateo, and I'm Dan Friedel. You're listening to the Learning English broadcast. I'll be back in a moment, but first. My colleague Ashley Thompson is here with some more information about a new program from Learning English. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions. And experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Thank you, Ashley. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thank you for listening. Thanks to my colleagues Anna Mateo, Ashley Thompson, John Russell, and Brian Lynn. We hope you enjoyed learning English with stories from around the world. If you want to find out more about the world in an English style that is a little bit slower, visit us at learningenglish.voanews.com. We will be back with more tomorrow, and we hope you tune in. I'm Dan Friedel.